and welcome back. Welcome back to Maternity Midwifery Hour. My name's Sue McDonald. I'm the curator and the chair for the Maternity and Midwifery Hour and the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals. And it's my delight to be chairing this evening's session. I've got two lovely, lovely speakers. I have Mo Tabib and I've got Stella Nwogo. No goo. No goo. Is that correct, Stella? Nwogo. Nwogo. Yes. I'm not good with either of my names. Anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. And because we always do this to our speakers, we ask them to share a lovely moment of the week. So I shall invite Mo to share her moment of the week first, if you please. I hope it's a good one. Sure. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, yesterday I had this uh, promoting physiology workshop with my third year students. And that was the first time we actually ran it this way. We had a rebozo workshop and we were holding hands, we were moving together. It was a really, I can say, the highlight of my week. It was really good. <laughs> wow. Wow. That sounds lovely. It sounds a very active learning. It and was... I know, Mo, that you're very into that sort of learning. So fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. How about Stella? Do you have a nice moment to share? Oh, wow. Uh, last Sunday, I was invited to a 50th birthday of a family friend. It was a lovely atmosphere, good background, food and drink, with good company. It was so fun. I, I had to force myself to leave because I had to work <laughs> this day. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. So that that's a professional, nice personal viewpoint, which is lovely. It's a perfect way to start the maternity hour. Now, I hope everyone who's watching... Get ready to, to listen to the rest of it. We're going to now just do a little the little bit of the news and where 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 the maternity hour came from, just to remind those of you who have been with us for a while. And for you, those of you the first time coming to the maternity hour, huge welcome. You're very welcome. And we're really pleased that you you're able to come. We re, just to say that we record everything. The Maternity and Midwifery Forum, we're obsessed with recording everything. So if you come to any activities, like any events, and the Maternity and Midwifery Hour, everything is recorded. And if you've registered for it, you can access it. And you can also access all the back information, all the back clips from way back. Um, we've got thousands of clips now, thousands of sessions that we've done. You can access them for free which is fantastic. So if you're doing any projects or dissertations or essays or anything like that, or you just need, mm, no, you need to do a bit of a revalidation check. Perfect. Because it's a really good way of learning, very um, engaging. And also it's not too difficult. You don't have to wade too, through too much. But having said that, I think after today's session, you are going to want to go and do some wading because there's some two very excellent articles by our two honoured guests that you are going to want to read. And those are on your resources sheets, which are available with on the web, on the web page, on the uh, Facebook page. Anyway, just to say we came into being with the first um, pandemic lockdown in March 2020 and I have to kind of remind myself it's four years now um, and it seems in some way it's gone really quickly and in some ways it hasn't because I don't think life will ever quite be the same certainly for most people um, and on that point we started doing the maternity and midwifery hour as a way of connecting midwives student midwives um, people who want to become student midwives some mums and dads um, and some, I know some obstetricians and pediatricians also link in with us. And it was a way of getting information in quite an accessible way. Because an hour at that time, if, and those of you will remember, very scary time, very busy time. And people who were working were having to work really hard. Well, they always work hard, but you know, it, it felt even harder, I think, at that time. So having an hour where you could update yourself and find out what was happening in the maternity service world was really important. So we were able to do that because obviously we couldn't have conferences or festivals or study days. So this was a way of connecting people, which was great. So I'm just going to reiterate, this is all free to access the other thing that we do have via the Mapflix, because Mapflix, the people who look after everything, is we have this sort of series of box sets where we have themed sessions 
or sections, which is looked after by Dr. Jenny Hall, who puts those together. So if you need something a bit more themed, you can also access that. And that's available either through a small subscription or if you have your maternity um, unit um, has subscribed or your university has subscribed, it's all for free as well. Fantastic. And they can be, that's a, also a good way. It's probably a better way for some of us like me. I get a bit addictive and I want to look at everything all the time and you you spend a lot of time on it. Anyway, perfect for study. I'm also now going to say a big thank you. And I've missed being able to say thank you to everybody for all the work you're doing to keep mums and babies well and cared for at this time. And I know it's just like it has been forever, it seems. People are under stress and working very hard to do that care. And so a big thank you to all of you. And it's a sincere one. Also to the student midwives, who also trying to balance their lives while they're learning to be midwives. Big thank you to you as well. Now I'm going to do a, just a quick news feature. Guess what? It's Stress Awareness Month. Hmm. So use our calendar. Now, those of you who know maternity, I will know that I love this action for happiness thing. You can access it for free. I love free things too. But this is a really lovely little mindful calendar. And each day you have to do something. And it's something to just come away from work, come away from study, come away from anything and just think about. So, I mean, for example, last week, which we weren't here, said have a day with less screen time and more movement. Well, how good would that be for those of us who sit behind computers so much time? But today... It said to me, be active outside, plant some seeds and encourage growth. Well, today in my home, it's been raining. It's been cold. I haven't wanted to go outside, but I did go outside and plant something. Look, I've planted a sunflower seed. So I'm going to see how this one goes and I'm going to watch it because there's something very joyful about watching something grow. So I've taken on board this lovely calendar. The link is on your resources, so you might like it as much as I do. We'll see what next week. Next week is quite good, too. There's always something to do. Anyway, so that's that. Now, updated also on available on your resources sheet is the updated Cochrane review on midwif midwife continuity of care versus models versus other models of care for childbearing women. Now, this is on the Cochrane database. Um, if you haven't ever accessed a Cochrane review, this is the this is the one to start with. It really goes through how Cochrane reviews are done, and it's really good. It's something we all need to know about. Um, and it, this is an intervention, and I love this little quote. It's been described as, if continuity of care was a drug, it would be a blockbuster. There. So we like continuity. Um, and some of the findings from doing all this sort of um, mega analysis what were some of the findings. Women who received midwife continuity care models less likely to experience the cesarean section, instrumental birth and episiotomy. Little difference to fetal loss and preterm birth. Women more likely to experience spontaneous vaginal birth and positive experiences during pregnancy, labour and the pubic postnatal period i want to say pew period and then i read postpartum there were cost savings to health systems which is always good because if we get a bit of cost savings we can afford more midwives so that must be good future research on impact on women with social risk factors medical complications and low mid mid, mid income countries are needed still so that's really gives you a point to where more research needs to be done. And I also want to highlight that the National Institute for Health and Care Research, the NIHR, have just launched their doctoral fellowship round 12. Again, have a look at the resources. Some of you out there may be just thinking, I wouldn't mind doing a bit of a PhD. And that is a very good resource, a very good pathway to get onto. So have a look at that when you have time. Now, this is perfect timing. We've got to 7.10 and I don't want to waste any time because we're going to be looking at um, two issues that might look initially a bit separate, but they're not because they're, we're looking at ways in which we work. So we're looking at emotional intelligence and compassion. And then we're looking at 
pay and working conditions, both of which are important to midwives and student midwives as they prepare to become midwives, in how we cope with our work and how we look after women and babies and families. And also retention. I nearly forgot retention and I'd have Stella shouting if I didn't remember that bit. So I'm going to, we're going to start off with um, Mo Tabib, now, who is a midwife lecturer at Robin, Robert Gordon University in Scotland. So she's really up in the cold at the moment. And it is really cold at the moment. For any of you in the UK, it's cold. Um, now, Mo has worked in a range of roles in a hospital, community, independent and as a research midwife prior to going into academia. Um, very close to clinical practice, I would say. Most current research interests and publications are focused on the influence of education interventions on the well-being of expectant parents, future and current midwives. And many of you will remember that Mo is also noted as an education trailblazer and was awarded in Edinburgh in 2022 for her work and, and very, pro, very proactive and re a real trailblazer. So welcome to Mo. Thank you for coming this evening. And now the screen is all yours. I don't know if Mo's presentation has hit a bit of a hitch. Our team will be looking at it and trying to get, get it un, unhitched. Just hang on. Don't leave anybody. Stay with us. Okay. Okay. It's going to be a bit like um, uh, the COVID updates. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> so apologies to the audience for a little technical hitch. But hopefully, oh, almost there. Excellent. 
Okay, Mo, the screen is now yours. Yes, the screen is there. Right, so we're almost there. <laughs> Apologies to everybody. So hopefully you can see it in full slideshow mode. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. So yeah, Sue has kindly asked me to talk about an emotional intelligence program or EIP that was made available to midwives and the research attached to it that explored midwives' experiences of the program. So, but before I start and introduce um, the research team that included Dr. Katrina Falls McCoy, who is a psychologist uh, at RGU, Robert Scotland University, Professor Tracy Humphrey uh, from University of South Australia, and myself. So just to give you a little bit of background um, to this program and the research, we all know midwifery is emotionally demanding, don't we? <laughs> and we have lots of now evidence that many midwives experience high levels of stress, anxiety, burnout, and unfortunately, a large percentage of them consider even leaving the profession. So this is a really critical concern for our profession and can have serious implication also for the quality of the maternity care that we provide. Uh, one of the major contributing factors to the problem is known to be the conflict between midwife's aspiration to actually truly being with the woman, um, connecting with her, supporting her emotionally, and the institutional ex expectations on the other hand, which focuses mostly on the kind of doing aspects of the job, physical care. And it's, you know, being mentally, emotionally present and available to a woman's psychological needs, whilst also meeting the institutional demands is really difficult and requires a really high level of emotional intelligence um, in the midwife. Well, good news is that <laughs> evidence suggests that emotional intelligence can be learned and can be increased through actually education. So we have previous studies showing that, for example, in populations such as nursing or medical students, this sort of education has been really promising. But there's a like paucity of evidence on midwives' experiences of such education. So and therefore, we decided to do this study with the aim to explore midwives' experiences of uh, an EI program. But what is EI? So EI refers to the ability to recognize, manage one's own emotions, and also recognize the emotions in others and manage relationships effectively. So, um, I do that to the concept of compassion. I would say this is compassion, you know, how you effectively connect to other people uh, and understand their emotion. I think that understanding the emotions of others, again, that's another term for empathy that are both essential for the midwifery care. So the AI program uh, that was used in this study was a four month program and had six group sessions, a total of 24 hours of contact time with the participants and used a combination of in-person and online sessions. Um, so, and a program uh, for the start, let me just give you a little bit of insight um, into the, this EIP, the program. So the foundation of program was actually based on the concept of self-recognition, recognizing that we as humans living in 21st century are conditioned to compulsive thinking. We have something around 40 to 70 thoughts per day, with 75% of these thoughts being negative ones. Now, the reflection of these thoughts in the body is called emotion. So when I come across a situation, I interpret that in my head in a certain way. In, well, we know it as a thought. And as a result, some chemicals are released in my body, causing some sensations, and we call that an emotion. So self-recognition is basically to recognize 
although my thoughts and emotions are a part of who I am, I am not just my thoughts and emotions. I am the one who can actually step back from these thoughts and observe them, I would say, sometimes silently and neutrally, perhaps creating some space. I'm saying, you know, I say to myself, oh, you know, here I am, and there are my thoughts and emotions. So this EIP aimed to help midwives repeatedly practice this stepping back process using relaxation methods, because relaxation methods would help with the shift of physiology in our body and shift up the focus from thinking mind to the breath and body, and basically reconditioning ourselves. So in classes, uh, the midwives practice applying these skills in the midwifery practice, you know, and for women as well. So we use, um, they, they use lots of scenarios, lots of simulated situation to actually apply these in practice. And then they had three big gaps between the sessions that, would, that allowed time for them to practice the land skills in real world with women, with, the, with even friends, family, and for themselves. So the study was a descriptive quality, had a descriptive qualitative design. Uh, we collected data using focus group interviews and analyzed them using reflective thematic analysis. Um, and it was, the data was collected in one Scottish health board and uh, midwives were recruited from different community teams. So the sample characteristics, yeah. I am on sample characteristics. Which slide are you in, Mo? Sample characteristics. I thought you, you can see what I can see. So it's. And the next one. And the next one. <laughs> So, so Angel, should I ask you to move this slide when I'm about to move or? Yeah, okay. So uh, altogether 15 midwives actually attended the program of whom 13 uh, participated in a study. They were all females aged between 23 to 58. So a good range from five rural and urban community teams. And they had between one to 30 years of work experience as a midwife. Next, please. So what did we find? Um, I'm just going about to go to the findings, but uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that the names you can see on the next slides uh, are not real names, they're just pseudonyms. And we can move to the next one, Angela, thank you. So the overall overarching theme of the findings was the ripple effect. So midwives saw the influence of the program on themselves as having a ripple effect, starting from them, me and my relationship first. And then that led to a different approach to their practice, which was the second theme, and ultimately to feeling of confidence and empowerment um, in their role as midwives. And we can move to the next one. So theme one and two, as you can see, they are in different colors. Um, they had some sub themes. Uh, I'm going to just look at, we're going to look at every sub theme separately one by one. Thank you, Angela. So for some, the influence of EIP and themselves actually came as a surprise because they kind of came to the program thinking they're going to take something and teach to women um, mainly. Um, I thought it was more going to be based on having to deliver a session to women through all kinds of childbirth spectrum. I'm surprised of how helpful it was for me as a person, as well as me as a midwife. Next one, please. Yeah, just develop a greater self-awareness, just differentiating between the thinker and the observer. So that those terms were actually frequently used in data the thinker and the observer. 
It's made me a calmer person rather than getting stressed, has helped me change as a person. To see things differently, not overthink as much and just take a breath and calm down. So that's how they saw the, or the self-awareness meant to them. You can go to the next one. They provided some examples of how they manage their emotions in highly stressful situations, including the stressful clinical situations. So this midwife uh, works in a, a standalone midwifery unit. She said she was having late accelerations. And so that initial panic, thinking about so many things in my head, my uncle midwife was 45 minutes away and I knew ambulances were always going to be an issue. So it was just that kind of initial panic, but then taking that a step back. And I've never experienced anything like that before. It was a really strong feeling where I felt I was almost out with my body, looking at the situation and just telling myself, all right, this is what I need to do. And this is the order you need to do it in. It's just thinking, taking that step back from being the thinker to become the observer and dealing with the situation. Next one. They went on to explain how this had an enhancing effect on their relationship with others, including family members as well. So it's just made me aware of like how I'm coming across. Um, because you can relax yourself, then we're a lot more open to taking more time for other people. And really taking on what they're saying, I think it, if you come across more open and relaxed, they're a lot more willing to divulge things to you, whether that be like a staff or women. It changed my relationship with my youngest daughter. That's a winner for me, that she she's managed to break through that, to talk to me about her emotions. Next, please. They suggested this helped them to um, better adopt a culture of presence. I think in the NHS, we definitely have a culture of just keep going attitude, keep going to, onto the next ship, onto the next clinic. It's just given me an opportunity to make the most of li little pockets of time. Just taking five minutes or 10, just with the woman, explore how she's feeling and go into that a bit deeper as maybe what I would have done before. Just taking that moment together. Next, please. And they utilize this skill actually in a very different and innovative ways. So Neve said, I had this couple came in for the first appointment and they'd had a really negative experience with her first baby. He was really angry. They came in the room like completely standoffish. I was really stressed. So he started thinking about the breathing techniques. And I thought I'd just be quiet for a few minutes. I felt it felt like forever, but just sat, relax my shoulders, listen. And after about five minutes, that atmosphere completely changed. I've never had that before. They were like laughing and like fine by the time that they left. It completely changed the whole experience. And I thought that was, that's because of that course I've been on. Next, please. Sorry, I'm struggling to move to the next myself. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and sometimes they use the techniques for women with needle phobia, for example. These are the examples they gave us, you know, when performing membrane sweep or high blood pressure, with women with high blood pressure or in latent phase of labor. She had a long latent phase and said, I just don't want to go home. I'm too scared. I said, do you want to try some relaxation? I think doing that little relaxation with her made her more relaxed and reaffirmed that she could do it at home. Then she did go home and came back four hours later, fully dilated, where she was only one centimeter when she went home. Yeah, it worked. She just needed that confidence to do it herself. Next, please. 
So and all of this kind of uh, led to the midwives feeling more confident and empowered in their role. It just kind of given me that belief in my role and the power that we have as midwives. And the difference we can make to somebody's experience, taking it from something that can potentially be very negative to turn that around to making it a positive experience and helping them cope and manage. And Nina added, and yourself as well. Next, please. So just to bring all the findings together, kind of this is our interpretation of the findings that by learning stress management strategies, midwives basically emotional well-being um, was promoted. And this reducing the stress in staff, I see it as like reducing the mental noise, getting some mental silence. And that silence would allow us to listen to better, better to the others. So, or, and feel actually how they feel, that sense of empathy. And this enhanced empathy, along with the skills they developed in alleviating emotional distress in women together, they believe that led to the more positive experiences for women. So this was perceived through like women's feedback to the midwife or the results that actually they observe for themselves, the results, the outcomes for the woman. So this is study obviously like any other study had some strengths and limitation to the best of our knowledge. It was the first uh, qualitative study exploring midwife's experience of an emotional intelligence program. Participants diversity in terms of age, seniority and workplace was another strength. And of course, like, you know, most qualitative studies, we had a small number of participants. It was, the study was conducted on one single study site, one health board, and we included only community midwives. So which could limit the generalizability of our findings. So in conclusion, equipping midwives with emotional management skills may improve their emotional well-being, experiences of practice, and potentially the quality of the care they provide. Therefore, implementation of evidence-based EI education in midwifery undergraduate curricula and midwife CPD should be considered. And of course, we need further research. We are currently are seeking you know, funding and collaboration opportunities uh, to undertake large scale multi-center studies, hopefully to investigate the effectiveness of evidence-based EI education on the well-being of current and future midwifery workforce and the maternity care quality that they provide. Uh, maybe it's worth adding that we actually did a pilot survey study as well. Well, it was a small only on 14 midwives, but that showed that there was actually a significant increase in the levels of trait emotional intelligence and mental well-being in midwives after the course compared with the baseline, which was just before they started um, the program. So if you're interested, of course, Sue has kindly shared the article, but there, that's a QR code also for the article. And thank you so much for listening and for your interest in the topic. And this is my email address. Um, so happy to be contacted. Thank you. Should I stop sharing now? <laughs> Uh, probably the next slide, Angelo, might make sense, if possible. There. There. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Mo. I, I mean, I loved, I loved the re reduction of the mental noise and the sort of, the, and reiteration this, how important the culture of presence is, the midwives, and how, I think that the, the quotes that you were using really summed up the the kind of um, the impact that something like this can have on midwives and they're thus on women and their families um, because it's so important, isn't it? That, fabulous. Thank you so much.
Okay, well, now, if you have any questions for Mo, start putting them into your chat box. And I'll take this opportunity just to say, welcome to our viewers in Sofia in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, Richmond, California, whoa, and Atlanta, Georgia in the USA. I love Atlanta, wonderful place, and Denmark, and Abu Dhabi. Fantastic. We've got the whole world with us this evening. I do apologise. I know there's been some connection problems and there's been a few little glitches here. And I'm so sorry about that. But hopefully you've got really the meat of what Mo was saying. These things happen. We Sometimes we just have a night when the gremlins are in. And tonight obviously was the gremlin night. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Stella Nugu. If I pronounce that wrongly again, I'm sure. I'm so sorry. I'm just going to say Stella, who is a registered nurse and midwife. She's currently maternity matron for inpatients, um, helpline, antenatal care, antenatal clinic, sorry, screening, infant feeding and immunisation team. So a small job, really, Stella. <laughs> Meant to laugh at that one. She's held, held many roles within maternity, including practice development, recruitment and retention, and project management. Um, she's also got a master's degree with a distinction in human resource management. And this evening, she's sharing her work in reviewing the effectiveness of pay and reward and its impact on mid midwifery staff retention. So welcome to Stella. Thank you so much for coming. The screen is now yours, and hopefully the gremlins are going away for a minute. Let's hope. Let's hope. Lovely. Is it better now? Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Sue, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. So I've been introduced, so I move on. And uh, my presentation is based on a research study I conducted in one of the maternity units here in England in 2022. And at that time, my supervisor was Andrew Bucock of the University of East London. And the research is to review the effectiveness of pay and reward and the impact it has on midwifery staff retention. So I'm just seeing your, your, your images. I can see you in front of my um, slides. I can't see all of my slides. I don't know why. Yeah, so I can see you. Uh, your your faces on one side of my slide. I can't see my slide. So I don't know if I should minimize. It, it will be too small, the characters. So. Yeah, but because it's in, in slideshow, I can't. I can't move it. I'm not sure I can. Let me try. No, it's not moving. It's just... Uh... Initially, your pictures, your faces were at the top, but this time it's on the side. It's on, on, on top of my slides. I don't know. Can you see yourselves on, on in front of my slides or not? Oh, wow. You... <laughs> All right, I will try and see, but it's blocking. Anyway, uh, we cannot. You can all agree with me that military staff shortage is posing a huge challenge to all maternity units in the in the in, in England here and in the NHS, and that has actually been exacerbated following COVID nineteen and uh, Brexit, and and that's due to economic and political changes, really. So the rationale for this research study is on a personal level, I've seen over the years uh, that uh, 
discrepancies in diversity management and career development. And also I noted quite a number of midwives and support workers left the profession over the recent years. So that prompted me to actually look into pay and reward strategies and how is that impacting on the retention of midwives and support workers. A strategic rationale for the research is that the trust that was being studied is committed to improving staff retention across all disciplines. King's Fund 2022 has also identified that all NHS uh, England are workers, that in, is in, there is crisis all over, and we really need to do something fast to return the staff that we have and also to fill the vacancies that we also have. So according to the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development of 2022, reward represents every financial provisions made available to employees. And it can be termed as a total reward if it includes non-monetary benefits as well, such as good leadership and flexible working arrangements and so on and so forth. So we keep talking about employee retention. What does it exactly mean? It's a process by which staff are actively encouraged to remain in a particular organization for a longer tenure or at least a particular project is completed. So we are not saying that somebody has to necessarily be in an organization from the beginning of their career till they retire. There's nothing wrong with that, actually. However, people can stay in an organization, learn and serve as much as possible, see another opportunity where they can learn, and they move on to another organization, infuse the system, challenges uh, things positively, and support the team to make innovations and bring about developments. So I personally see it as a cross-pollination because you go and you make changes and you learn as well. So the impact of high staff turnover cannot be overemphasized, really. It leads to delay in executing projects and impacts on organizational performance. It brings about low morale in teams. Assuming there are five members of staff working together and then all of a sudden one leaves this month, three months later another one leaves, the other ones will be wondering what is happening here. So it brings about low morale and it can jeopardize the realization of organizational goals because departing employees live with their experiences and that impacts on the human and intellectual capital of organizations. So the objectives of the research include impact of hygiene or environmental factors on staff retention, the balance of intrinsic and intrinsic motivation, as well as career structure and how that impacts on staff retention. So literature review, leaders who are present are capable of creating an environment that makes staff feel valued and motivated, and as such that improves retention. Koha et al. in 2019, they conducted a study to, to establish the impact of um, support from leaders. And they, they looked into a two-year program, two-year period, staff who are appointed, the ones that left, the reason why they left, and the ones who stayed and why they stayed. So they discovered that those staff who stayed felt that there was support from their leaders and their managers. So it's really important that managers and leaders support staff so they can stay and feel more comfortable in their working areas. So there's a theory here called husband two factor theory. Basically, I'm not gonna go into so much detail. Basically, there are two factors. One of them are known as satisfiers and is about the interest of an employee in their job and the opportunities that are available and the other factor is about working conditions, leadership, and the, the, the environmental factors are likened as a launch pad. You know, when we are launching uh, off a rocket into space, so you have to have a launch pad that is stable. So the hygiene factors are that launch pad and the rocket is like a motivation really. So if the hygiene factors are inequitable, that, that, that they are not well distributed, the staff will feel really irritated. It would not matter so much about the opportunities available. They will look around themselves and they will wonder, this place is really hostile. So they feel discouraged and they will not be motivated. 
So some more literature review about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is about individuals feeling towards their work, being interesting, and it's linked to positive emotions, really. And it helps employees to deal with stress. While extrinsic motivation is the desire to carry out a task, to avoid a negative consequence, or to achieve an outcome or meet a target. For instance, uh, somebody might be punished for not meeting targets. So the excessive use of extrinsic motivation of this sort reduces the intrinsic motivation and leads to dissatisfaction and discontent of staff. And that impacts on the quality of service the staff provide. So more literature review on the balance of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Please note that the motivation level of staff determines the overall effectiveness of employees and the success of each organization. Reduced motivation levels leads to job satisfaction, increase in absenteeism and employee turnover. So on career development, career development definitely improves staff morale and performance. Because it's about intellectual capital, the capability of doing their work, and it increases productivity. It enables employees to move towards self-actualization and develop their potential. And drawing on uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when uh, applied to working condition, for an individual to reach to the pinnacle of their career, certain basic needs must be met. Otherwise, they are not going to achieve that. It needs such as safety needs, uh, belonging needs, esteem needs uh, have to be met. So physiological needs for us in the working place uh, are about things like such as providing uh, basic amenities, a uh, good uh, uh, environment where staff can have break and have a little bit of reflection away from so much sound and distraction. Belonging needs when met prevents and reduces anxiety. People want to work in a place where they feel like part of a team, part of the group. Meeting esteem needs makes staff feel accepted and competent because lack of recognition leads to discontent and is a primary reason why people leave their job because they feel they don't matter. And if you don't value them, well, they can look for a place where they feel celebrated, really. So safety as well is important, physical safety, psychological safety. We need to avoid arbitrary use of you know, high and tough disciplinary processes. We need to use education and a better approach to, to, to support staff during things like that. So in terms of the methodology of this study, the philosophy used is interpretism, interpretivism rather, and is to uncover the lived experience of middle free staff. And the approach used was induction. There was no preconceived theory which allowed emergence of research findings without restraints. So the strategy used was um, interview and it involved uh, support workers, midwives of different bands, different generation and ages, working in different clinical areas of the maternity. And the reason for that sampling is because this group of staff are exposed to, and they have adequate experience to be able to provide answers that are credible regarding the research questions and objectives. So the findings regarding environmental factors, I didn't want to use graphs. I'll just talk through the figures. 80% of the staff interviewed, they say they, have, they had good relationship with their peers, and that depends on who was working with them or who is on shift. But 7% say that staff from some ethnic group, sometimes there's formation of cliques, and they tend to support each other while at work and tend to leave some other person or some other people isolated. And that really impacts on staff confidence and the ability to, car to carry out their roles. 73.3% say they struggle to escalate issues due to fear of being criticized. And this made them feel so stressed while at work. 86.6% say that leadership appears to be very transactional. So it's all about what you're achieving, the targets, and what you're doing. That the leaders don't seem to formulate relationship with their juniors. And 60% of staff think that 
senior leaders are not listening to them. So a midwife just mentioned and said, oh, we've got dictators who pretend that they are listening, but they are not taking on board whatever you're saying. So we really need to work on this relationship. So more findings about equipment. All staff interviewed said it's so frustrating for you to get into work. There are no equipment to do your job. You're running around looking for equipment from one room to the other. Why the leaders are saying that it appears the staff are not really reporting and sending off 40 equipment. However, the managers are saying that actually the process of ordering and tracking equipments, it takes too long, really. It just takes too long. So, and, you know, looking at it, lack of equipment not only impacts on self-care provision, but it's also it affects staff confidence and their psychological well-being. They're struggling and arguing over blood pressure machine or CTG machine, who has used it, who has done it quickly or not. Things like that impact on working relationships. More findings on intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. 73% of staff interviewed said they're happy with flexible working and that they found it quite compassionate of their managers. However, 27% mentioned that they did not know about this policy at all that they really struggled to be supported with flexible working. All the managers interviewed, they're so happy to support staff with flexible working, though it has to be done within reason to ensure safety. 80% of staff appreciated the use of blue light cards because it helps them get discount while shopping. And 20% said that they were not aware of this discount at all. They did not know about the cards. And 27% say that discounts are only um, given in certain shops. If you shop in some other shops, you're not going to get a, dis a discount unless you go to certain places. 100% say that well-being support is not equitably accessible. And support from PMA is minimal. And that, that is due to staff shortage. So most of the PMAs are always working. Even when they plan to do their restorative sessions, they end up being clinical. So the availability is not as optimal as it should be. If 7% say that bank rate is very poor and that the salary received does not reflect the amount of work done. This is affecting especially junior staff. They complain so bitterly. And some of them, because of this, they are reducing their hours. Instead of one whole time equivalent, they cut down their hours because they need time to do agencies because it gives them a little bit more money so they can make ends meet. And thereby we are losing our staff and our whole time equivalent is reduced and we keep recruiting. Remaining staff are then left with increasing workloads and they are still expected to provide high quality individualized care. So staff are extrinsically motivated to work as hard as possible and without break sometimes, just to have peace of mind and to ensure the safety of clients. So this suggests that there is an imbalance between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, especially for junior staff and maternity support workers. 80% of staff, this is about career development now, 80% of staff, including managers, have described our yearly appraisal as a tick box exercise that leads to nowhere. 7% find it a useful opportunity to sit down with their managers to discuss any burning issue. And one support worker literally told me that it's not worth it. Things are planned and discussed every year, same thing every year, and midwives are busy ticking boxes. And some of the midwives doing the appraisal do not even know the staff that are doing the appraisal. And the midwives don't even know them. So how could you appraise somebody you don't work with, you don't know, and you cannot follow up during the year? All of the maternity support workers, they felt there's no room for career development for them in midwifery. And as such, some of them are ending up retiring as Bantus or they leave to go into nursing because there are better opportunities for them to progress. 60% think that the, the recruitment process is not fair, it's not transparent, and this is affecting staff commitment. And according to expert time theory by Vroom, 
It depends the motivation of staff and the engagement. It depends on how attractive an opportunity is and how likely they are, they are going to get it. So if I'm a band two and I really want to move up to become a band four, what's attracting me to do that? How much will my salary be as a band four? What's the difference? And even though I tried, am I really going to get that position? So if I'm not convinced, then I will not even try at all. So there are limitations to this research study though. Time constraints, because I had to round up to complete my thesis at some point. There were limited resources as well, because the midwives were busy. It was difficult to get them to be interviewed. Quota sampling was chosen instead of purposeful sampling. And as such, I could not reach saturation. So this research study does not provide us with absolute scientific evidence. However, it provides us with some clues as to the motivational reasons why staff could potentially leave their jobs. Our recommendations, there are heroic and post-heroic forms of leadership styles. However, I recommend distributive leadership because it is collaborative, it is integral. Through effective communication, staff understand the reason why we're asking them to do what they're, they're supposed to be doing. Instead of thinking that is what the leader wants us to do. And it reflects inclusive and compassionate culture. So leaders and managers require training and I know we are improving in that area, there are so many leadership opportunities. However, there are still staff who are promoted to band seven, band eight. There's really no managerial training or adequate support in terms of leadership. So we need to continue doing that and getting better. So we need to encourage group activities a way they, we don't necessarily need to leave our working environment to have a, rec a reflective time. Doing group work, this breaks down the walls of racism and segregation. We get to understand each other, the way we communicate, our cultures, and how we come across. To ensure clear communication between leaders and staff, so, lead, uh, so staff feel listened to. The trust well-being services as well should be made accessible to all staff, and occupational health referral should be done after long-term sickness. It should not be business as usual. Local equipment management policies need to be reviewed. And we can actually order better quality equipment that will last longer. Because we are worth it and the job we do is worth it. We need to review our bank rates so it's attractive. Creating awareness about that blue light card for discount because it's really helpful these days. Regular performance appraisals and follow-up. And uh, staff and managers should be educated on the usefulness of appraisals. So we need to ensure safety. We need to be protected for incivility and disrespect. We should all be feeling confident to speak up within reason and to listen to what lies behind the walls when somebody's speaking to us. Talent management, very essential, or scaling staff, supporting secondment and shadowing senior staff and use of apprenticeship levy, especially for our support workers to upscale them. So in summary, very important for us to utilize total rewards to secure midwives and maternities well and intention to, re to return to remain in their jobs. And that means utilizing both monetary and non-monetary awards. And according to CIP, the total reward is necessary in attracting and motivating employees to stay in their job. And final statement from me, I know we say we care about mothers and I know we do. If we really care about mothers, bathing people, their babies and families, we need to cherish our midwives and maternity support workers. These are some of the references. And thank you so very much for listening. Fabulous, Stella. That's fantastic. And, and what a lovely way to finish with cherishing our midwives and our student midwives and our maternity care support. Actually, everyone within the maternity care team. That's fantastic. Thank you. And you've given us a lot to think about, an enormous amount of recommendations. And, and I think I will refer anyone who's watching 
to both of these articles because there's a, obviously we can only give give a, a fraction of what's in the actual research and the work that's underpinning the presentations. And I'm always very mean because I usually give a very short space to our speakers, uh, but at least those who are watching have got these to, to refer to, which is fantastic. Now we've just got a, a little time for some questions. Uh, and thank you to those who sent questions in. And one question is from Blessing in the United States. So hi, Blessing, who says here in the United States, we're big on cultural competence. Is there a cultural component to emotional intelligence as it pertains to midwifery or healthcare as a whole? I think that one's a question for Mo. And you'll need to take your... your um, you're muted. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So cultural competence and emotional intelligence. I believe, you know, when if we go back right back down to the concept of self-recognition, when I understand myself, you know, not as my thoughts, not as, as my emotions, not as my skin color, or the language I speak. So, so all of that. So I think when we recognize who we are as human beings, and that thing is actually connected regardless of where we're coming from, you know, what language we're speaking, et cetera, that itself, that then we start to see others differently. We start to stop separate that those separations, seeing people as, you know, taking that stance of like us and them culture. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we, if you're talking about the program that, you know, we had here, there was no specific talk about, you know, cultural competence and, you know, cultural differences, etc. But I believe that going back to the basics of self-recognition and self-awareness, and that would, I think, would also um, address this question. I don't know if I've answered your question, blessing, or I understood it hopefully properly. <laughs> I think I think that that's a good a good answer because I think and what what hit me is as Stella was talking and I was thinking a lot of these the, the things that you've been talking about about self-awareness and and even now as you responded to that question is about not us and them and that some of what Stella was saying was very much about us and them and trying to the people experiencing an us and them so the sort of self-awareness, emotional intelligence bit of it comes in as part of, for me, part of what is the sort of hygiene factors, if you like. And I thought you put that beautifully well as, as well, Stella, about the needing the both things, the sort of, um, now what was it, about satisfiers and the hygiene factors, because we don't just operate on one thing, we need the two together. And I think most of us who've worked in a, a stressful setting will know if you're in a team that you feel supported and loved by, and I use the word advisedly because we should at least like or love our, our, our um, colleagues, you can cope with a heck of a lot and money doesn't really matter except at the end of the month when you've got to pay your bills, of course. So thank you for that. That's lovely, Mo. Now I've got another, another comment from Juliet Samuel. Hi, Juliet. And, and she's, Essex way and she's saying good evening good evening Dr Mo and Stella and Sue Dr Mo is there a possibility that culture it's another culture one which within which many midwives work might negatively impact on midwives development or use of emo emotional intelligence so this time it's about whether it's a bar yeah well nice absolutely question. absolutely Yes, <laughs> the culture can impact uh, our emotional intelligence. Um, and I think I, I want to highlight, you know, because, you know, when we talk about emotional intelligence uh, or even programs that are educational, that they, there's actually a wide variety of them. Hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't agree with just giving methods to people, just giving a method that you just increase your emotional, you know, um, so I believe, yes, definitely culture impacts, but 
again, I just want to go back, just having that particular understanding of self and human beings, who we are, and how we all connected, actually. And, and the fact that, you know, I learn, you know, I think that that's something that has been actually a big learning for me. When I learn, I'm not my thoughts and emotions. Then I start to kind of forgive myself for the things that I used to kind of beat up myself for. And if that's the case, well, that's the case for others as well, isn't it? So mm. I see, I start kind of, I approach other people with more compassion, with more forgiveness. Um, and I think if it can bring that forgiveness, I think emo the impact both, so emotional intelligence is about being more compassionate towards other people. And that definitely also has an effect on the culture. Mm. So I think my sort point is emotional intelligence and, and this lovely audience of ours uh, is the other way around how culture impacts emotional mm. intelligence. And um, yeah, there, that, I think I believe that's a two way things. Both can impact each other. That was great. Thank you. Because and now Julia, Julia is responding here so, to say now, well done, Stella. A great insight was achieved from your study. Do you think now, Juliet, you're having a second question here. Do you think that although not scientific, that templated to many trusts, that your findings might be reflected or might be recounted by many other midwives? That's a good question too. So you did you did one trust. So would it be would it be similar things in others, do you think? I would think so. Mm. Yes, I would think so. Especially when you think about the objectives that I, I reviewed. Mm. I would think so. Career development, we can all relate to it. How we are developing, the support we are receiving. We can always think about our motivational levels. How excited we were when we graduated or when we got into the career and when things are beginning to happen over the years, if we reflect on it, we can certainly think, how am I being extrinsically motivated? And my intrinsic motivation, where is it? At what level is it? Mm. And when so you think about hygiene factors as well, it's all around us. So wherever you walk, even outside midwifery, really, so environmental factors are always there. So I believe it's relatable across the board. Mm. So anyone who's watching, you might want to just have a look and ask these questions of your colleagues, maybe over a cup of coffee. Uh, for the one thing that, and it's not the major part of it, because I think the, the career development and the support from senior managers, et cetera, et cetera, it, it's, it's a bigger thing. But I thought the in an interesting area was your finding about machines and equipment so the the managers were seeing the machines and equipment weren't being reported as being broken staff were aware that it wouldn't be fixed even if they reported it so there seems a real dislocation there and it sort of takes you back to it's such a basic thing and i i like the fact you said well let's get some decent equipment because we're worth it yes. i'd love that that's <laughs> what i'm thinking about I'm. I don't. I'm just checking to see if there's any more questions coming through. I think people are a little, probably a little bit stunned by the sort of the recommendations. Actually, Stella, you've given us all some homework to think about how we operate in the in the clinical area. I mean, one of the other one thing I need to say is, as you were saying about midwives not feeling their managers were supportive. I was thinking, wondering about how the managers are feeling supported themselves. I mean, that would be, a, a, I don't know if you asked that one, but it's, it's kind of whether people get into this thing or oh, it's the manager's fault, it's their fault. And then, the, you know, it's like it used to be like the day staff used to complain about the night staff, didn't they? And the night staff used to complain about the day staff. Having someone to com to blame rather than actually saying, well, they've got a hard job too. Yes. How can I support them? Maybe that's another, another question. Anyway, I always say this is the quickest hour in the week, and it certainly is this 
this this evening has gone so so quickly i do apologize for our glitches the the, the gremlins are, are about but by next week we should have sorted them gremlins out good and proper so thank you for your patience both mo and stella and for our lovely audience and and I do say a big thank you to Mo and Stella for opening up the these discussions, which are of really important issues for us as midwives and student midwives to know about. I also say thank you to Angelo for doing slide moving and making sure things are working as well as they can at the moment. And Paul for sending through the questions to me. Um, resources will be available later in the week. And, and I need to just remind you, there's the Midlands Festival coming up on the 14th of May. Next week on the Maternity Hour, we're going to take a, it's a slight look at, in a way, it's a passing on from what we've discussed this evening, because we're going to look at work-life balance, because we all need a bit of that these days, a time that everyone, everyone's so stressed and, and it's so hard. So we'll say a big thank you to everybody for being with us. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you same time, same place next week. So take care. Bye.